Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our last presentation in our fall webinar series, Harnessing the Gut-Brain Access for Neurological and Endocrine Balance, presented by Dr. Paul Herkel. Before we get started, we would like to go over a few housekeeping items. There will be a complimentary ProD stress sample for all of our professional accounts and a Xenthianine sample for all retail accounts awarded to those of you attending the live session. If you would like to receive your free sample, please provide us with your clinic and store phone number, account number, and mailing address by using the link provided in the chat box. The chat box can be located on the right-hand side of your screen in the control panel. Please be aware that only one sample will be sent per account and they will be sent as part of your next order. There will also be a Q&A session at the end of the pre presentation, time permitting. If you would like to ask a question, you can do so throughout the presentation by typing it into the question box in the control panel at the right side of your screen. Please note the slides are available for download in the control panel and this presentation is being recorded for future distribution. We're now ready to begin, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Paul. Thanks for joining us today, Paul. Thanks so much, Cassie, for the great intro. Uh, it's really one of my um, passion pro, uh, topics to talk about. I'm excited this is the last one here of our, of our fall webinar series. Okay, so we have a lot of information that we need to get to, so I'm going to jump right into it. All right, we're just gonna just fire it up here so we're all recording. Um, okay, good stuff. Okay, so Cassie, we're gonna iron, I'll get started. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the topic of gut-brain axis is one of the, I think, most important topics that we're going to be discussing as clinicians, as people that are trying to understand how do we optimize our brain health, and what is the connection between all this research that's being done in the microbiome, as well as on neurological conditions. And there's this, this is really neat connection. So I'm going to jump right into it because we have a lot to cover. I'm going to be introducing some new concepts to you. And hopefully you're going to be able to, if you are a clinician that you're attending, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you're attending. If you are uh, one of our retail partners or anybody else, hopefully you'll be able to grab a couple pieces of take home information. Some of the information is quite science heavy, but I'm going to try to distill it down as much as possible. A couple of the key housekeeping rules uh, and, and points to kind of uh, keep in mind, obviously nothing that we're talking about is going to be for prescriptive or diagnostic um, reasons. Okay, so let's jump right in. So we know about the gut-brain axis. A lot of media, a lot of scientific literature experts is now starting to talk about it. And one thing that I wanted to kind of just share with you, a couple key points that as I was preparing for this presentation, always strike me. So number one is that we have more bugs in our body by 10 times than we have cells in our body. Just let that kind of sink in. That should tell you a little bit about the importance of our friends inside of a microbiome. And it's actually not just our microbiome. There's bacteria on our skin, there's bacteria in our mouths, there's bacteria in the urinary tract. Actually, there's bacteria almost throughout all of our uh, bodies, especially as they interface with the outside environment. So it's extremely important that we have a very symbiotic relationship with these, with these uh, bacteria and fungi and viruses, which is just the whole next level that we're gonna be looking at in the future. The other important point is that most of the fibers, most of the sensation is actually going up from the gut to the brain, not the other way around. You think that, you know, our brain controls the gut. It's actually majority of it's the other way around. There's no doubt we're going to talk about the key pathway, the vagus nerve, as it controls the from the brain down to the gut. But let's keep in mind that most of the fibers are actually going back up, 80 to 90% of them. We have receptors throughout our digestive system. And, and one of the big topics now is cannabis. And I recently did a webinar for AOR on palmitol ethylenamide or PEA. And we'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. And that is part of the endocannabinoid system. And cannabis is well known for stimulating this hormone called ghrelin. And so we've been using ghrelin stimulators in the form of bitters for many, many years. And this is just kind of the next botanical application of stimulating digestive function with botanicals. And then finally, 40% of the things that are floating around in our bloodstream, so not the stuff that you would get tested at a lab if you want to go check for anemia, but some of the metabolites, bile acids, short chain fatty acids, things that are in the bloodstream, these are things actually produced by the gut. So that was a really, really aha moment 
for me to say, hey, you know what, these bugs are producing things that are extremely relevant and useful for cells in our body. So keep that in mind as we kind of go through this presentation. So I already shared with you a little bit about, and this is kind of a graphic representation, a little bit about how all the different things that influence from the gut up to the brain. So for example, you can see here, there are hormones. So 5-HT is serotonin. You can see cytokines, so the inflammatory cells, bacterial products, specific nerves directly connecting, and then also stress hormones. So noradrenaline and some of the adergenic nerves, they're coming down from the brain down. So stress has an impact on the microbiome, but there's a, a big highway of communication back and forth. So I mentioned the vagus nerve, and so I wanna just, just really take a moment to focus in on what the vagus nerve is and how it actually plays a role in balancing the two arms of our autonomic nervous system. So the enteric nervous system is the nervous system we have inside of our digestive tract. But even to understand that, we need to take a step back even one further and look at the brain. So I promise this is as complex as gonna get in terms of neuroanatomy. And I know that when I was in school, this was very, very overwhelming, but I wanna just really distill it down. We've all heard of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, the SNS and the PNS. What the anatomy graphic on the right here shows is that you can't have the sympathetic nervous system on at the same time as the sympathetic. You can't have the para and the sympathetic on at the same time. And think of this in, in my, a lot of my patients, a lot of people that you know, and maybe yourself, is that symptoms of high sympathetic tone are fight and flight, action, um, uh, preparation, preparing for blood flow, uh, fueling muscles, the heart rate goes up, our breath slows down. So these are all things the body does to survive. However, if we're constantly in that, we are now going to be suppressing our parasympathetic nervous system because those two neural pathways can't come out at the same time. They kind of are mutually shutting each other off. So I just show this little graphic to my patient here, this little teeter-totter showing how high sympathetic tone is equal to a suppression of the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system. And what are all the things that the parasympathetic nervous system does through the vagus nerve? So that's the main nerve that connects the brain and the rest of the body. That's the vagus nerve. So let's review some of these. So if the vagus nerve is not properly functioning or if it's being suppressed by the sympathetic nervous system, first thing a person may notice is that they're gonna have decreased muscular function or another word for that is motility, the ability for the intestines to properly transfer its contents. So a lot of times these are symptoms like IBS, spasticity, the gut is cramping all the time pain, maybe even bloating. Our digestive system wants to have smooth peristalsis. The se second thing you might notice with that second branch of the vagus nerve is that you're gonna have decreased the secretion of certain key digestive juices, enzymes, hydrochloric acid, the vagus nerve controls some of those things. And as soon as you have a decrease in function of those, you're not breaking down foods as well, you have lots of extra protein, now being worked on by the microbiome, and now you're starting to get leakiness or intestinal hyperpermeability. We've all heard of leaky gut before, and now you're getting these bacterial products, even more than normal, being seen by the systemic immune system. So you're gonna get this thing called LPS or lipopolysaccharide, which is a very inflammatory molecule now being exposed to our immune cells and cells throughout our whole body, and that has a neurologically in inflammatory property. And you can see there's a direct influence of the immune cells. So cytokines are immune inflammatory mark, uh, signaling molecules or markers, and they actually have been linked in the research to decrease mood and change mood. So whether it's depression or anxiety, and there's this thing called the inf inflammation theory of mood disorders. And that's what the latest research is showing. So you can just see by a poorly functioning vagus nerve, you have four different ways that you can have a tremendous amount of impairment of things that we take for granted every day because the vagus nerve is functioning behind the scenes all the time. Now, that might be really, really doom and gloom. However, I'm here to share with you something that even 
in school, I didn't learn. And until I really understood the research and, and understand understood the path of physiology, I didn't quite appreciate. If a system can become imbalanced, like the vagus nerve and the sympathetic versus parasympathetic, it stands the reason the body is very intelligent. It also has the ability to heal itself. And so the vagus nerve, when properly functioning, has a tremendous anti-inflammatory effect. There's actually three mechanisms, and you can see them here, by directly regulating our body's powerful hormones, our cortisol, that's what HPA axis stands for, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, axis which produces cortisol. It actually directly interacts with macrophages, which are immune cells, which can decrease inflammation. And then actually going into the spleen, which is kind of our power plan manufacturing facility for all our white blood cells and immune cells that produce inflammation. These are the three ways the vagus nerve, when properly functioning, can regulate inflammation. So that's a, that's a message of, of therape actually therapeutic hope how can we leverage the vagus nerve? How can we turn it back on? Well, obviously we're gonna talk about that throughout the rest of this webinar, but I wanna mention a couple things just on a very practical level. The vagus nerve, just like any nerve, is when you stimulate it, it can, st it can increase its function. So the vagus nerve comes out from the central nervous system, the brainstem here, comes out primarily through the throat area here, the soft palate, and this is, where you can actually access portions or branches of the vagus nerve. Tongue, inner surface of the ear is a very common one. So I want, this is gonna start, for some people, kind of reminding them for, hey, you know what? I did le learn about auricular acupuncture and, and so did I in school and I use it in clinical practice quite frequently as a very therapeutic tool. And now we know that it can actually be a way to stimulate the vagus nerve. And if you look at this diagram of the ear, it actually, most of the vagus nerve is going to be on the inner part of the ear. So kind of that, that uh, indent where you can see that between the point zero and Chen Men and in, in inside right to where the actual ear canal is. So these are places that we can actually access the nerve. And then these are basic, really inexpensive, everyday things that you can do that I share with my patients that increase vagus nerve tone or vagus nerve activity. Remember, we're trying to flip that teeter-totter back. So if the sympathetic nervous system is really elevated, we need to raise the parasympathetic and we need to decrease the sympathetic. And these suggestions do both of those. So some of the basic ones, deep breathing, the diaphragmatic breathing, so using your abdomen to breathe, just like babies, rather than kind of that, that upper shallow, the small part of our lungs breathing, that's not gonna activate the vagus nerve, which has so many nerve endings in our diaphragm. So that's one of my favorites, slow diaphragmatic breathing. Things like yoga, meditation have all been, that's been a key central part of their practice. A couple other ones I wanna bring your attention to, some of my favorites, gargling. Gargling in, a lot of the nerve comes out of this, this vagus nerve comes out of the soft palate. So gargling helps stimulate the vagus nerve function. Belly laughing, especially that deep laughing, it activates the diaphragm. And then many other things you can see here, I've listed a couple of them. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but there's different tools and even technology with vagus nerve stimulators, with stimulating the tongue, stimulating the ear. Actually, there's certain uh, treatments for intractable epilepsy that are now implanting vagus nerve stimulators onto the vagus nerve that, that, that shows itself here again in the neck with actually phenomenal results considering that this particular type of epilepsy is just resistant to any medications. So there's a number of ways that we can target and leverage this anti-inflammatory pathway that the vagus nerve provides. A couple other things that are more relevant to our particular discussion today is nutrition. Nutrition has a role to play stimulating the vagus nerve. So for example, if we eat healthy fats in our diet, it has a way of stimulating the vagus nerve through something called the cholecystokinin. It, is, it, actually, it, it, it actually is a hormone produced by our intestinal tract, and it can help increase the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. That's the vagus nerve. So think of, you know, keto, intermittent fasting, anything that increases fat typically in our diet, even certain types of paleo diets that are, that are rich in good fats. And then also think about some of the tools that we have in our nutritional toolbox, like phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylserine, 
Um, citicoline, something that, that AOR has as a formula that um, recently we just kind of updated to um, a formula, an extract specifically called Zero News that's from, uh, from Europe that has a tremendous amount of research, even more than the extract that we had before. And citicoline is a precursor to all the different types of phospholipids. And that requires a webinar unto itself, but I just want to share with you that citicoline is a great tool that has neurological benefit, so clinically studied in things like stroke, but also as a good fat as well. And then finally, some of the things that, that this paper, this chart in this paper highlight are things that we've already talked about. So this is how we can stimulate the vagus nerve. On a practical level, there also is this this decreasing some of the negative effects of overactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. So one of my favorite tools is something called Pro GI, uh, Pro Dis BioX. It's a part of our GI family of formulations in the Pro series, and this formulation really is focused on decreasing the spasticity of smooth muscle. So it was it was designed as well to kind of be a key part of SIBO protocols, of dysbiosis, candida protocols because of the oregano oil and thyme. But if you look at the peppermint oil is actually the highest main ingredient. And peppermint is a really nice antispasmodic herb. It's traditionally used as a carminative, but when you're using it as an essential oil, it can actually stop spastic, uh, spasticity and that kind of effect of that high sympathetic nervous system very, very quickly, and people notice a very symptomatic improvement, as well as the oregano oil and the thymol have this more broad spectrum antimicrobial action. And one of the key takeaways I, I wanna share with you about this BioX is that it, it will help a person feel better really quickly, rather than, you know, typically if giving an oregano or thyme, a lot of these patients or these people actually feel worse right away because you're gonna be having that die-off reaction. The peppermint has that nice relaxing carminative effect and you're gonna have a person that's gonna be in pain, discomfort, someone with IBS can take a formulation like this and feel better right away as well as addressing the underlying dysbiosis. Okay, so that's kind of a more practical application. Now we're addressing more of the central nervous system with pro-de-stress. So de-stress, also a unique pro formula, I should mention that pro Dis BioX is available in the pro series. So it's available through your healthcare practitioners. Pro series is, is something, is a line that's specifically designed for clinicians. And these are two of the unique formulations that are not found in AOR's retail line. Uh, so pro de stress is a, is a formula that really works also very quickly. You can see the ingredients, GABA, L-theanine and holy basil. We'll talk about these in more detail in a second. But I really like using a formulation like this for people that want acute kind of anxiety and they have this almost like hypoglycemic effect. So let me tell you a little bit about that when we look at some of the ingredients that are in it. So GABA, we're all very familiar with it. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, for some people, it works really, really well. I had a patient again this week that found GABA plus magnesium made a huge difference in not just falling asleep, but staying asleep. So it works for some people. But one of the things that some clinicians and the scientists are asking is, how does it work? It, is it too big to cross the blood-brain barrier? That's one of the theories. There might be a transporter in the blood-brain barrier. Is the blood-brain barrier permeable? This is a really interesting question because I have some colleagues using it as a permeability test, especially in the US. Um, and then finally, could it be that the enteric nervous system, so bringing it full circle back to the vagus nerve, could it be that the bacteria in our gut and some of the peripheral nervous system receptors are actually being acted upon by, by GABA and it is having indirect kind of inhibitory calming effect, even if it can't fully cross the blood-brain barrier in every situation. So I think based on the research, I subscribe to this third theory where at times, it, you could have blood-brain barrier um, permeability with, with, for example, L-arginine, but I think most of the action of GABA is peripheral. So it's not even having to have to, have to cross the blood-brain barrier to have a beneficial effect. Um, so for people that really like it, it works really, really well at having a very rapid calming effect. Theanine is one of my favorites. It's found in green tea. I'm enjoying a green tea right now. Uh, it's 
an amino acid, very, very safe. It's been studied for all sorts of different indications, anxiety, insomnia, blood pressure, especially related stress, stress. For someone that's caffeine sensitive, it can offset that. They happen to drink caffeine by accident. Um, but some of the lesser known benefits of theanine are its effect on glutathione. So um, there's some research showing you both in uh, immune support and it actually is a precursor or part of the precursor to glutathione where we all hear about cysteine and NSE, but also theanine and its connection to glutamate, it has a very powerful kind of balancing effect and stimulatory effect to glutathione. So I really like theanine for its very rapid calming effect. Within you know, 20 to 30 minutes, people will notice a difference. And then finally, holy basil. So holy basil is this really neat herb that has this ability to balance blood sugar as well as having kind of this anti-inflammatory, anti-anxiety mood balancing effect. Um, there's a number of active ingredients. Um, most of the research is on blood sugar and kind of that metabolic aspect. Uh, things like hypertension, blood sugar, obesity, et cetera. But there also are other benefits to holy basil, ones that um, are specific to mood and the HPA axis. For example, here I just show you four studies. These are human clinical trials showing a decrease in anxiety, the improvement in fatigue, sleep, sexual dysfunction, improvement in memory. So holy basil has the ability to work on the brain as well as on uh, hypoglycemia and that's one of my main takeaways with with holy basil is that I really like to use it for people that are stressed out but they have this thing called dysglycemia their blood sugar is bouncing all over the place they're having to cr they're craving things all the time so that's something that is really helpful and actually quite unique to a lot of things that we have in our toolbox because we often overlook that dysglycemia which can contribute to further symp sympathetic overdrive the nice thing also about e-stress is that you can kind of dose it uh, based on the person. So you can start with a very low dose, but you can increase it uh, to even, even a higher dose. So this is mainly for the clinicians that I'm speaking to here, and you can kind of play with it with your, with your patients. But because the dose of GABA is a lot lower than the standalone GABA that AOR has, you're, allowed, you, you're allowing to have a, little, a lot more flexibility, but you're still getting a great dose of holy basil and a great dose of L-theanine. So it can be quite effective even in acute um, and uh, higher dose situations. So let's shift gears and now move back to this gut-brain connection. So we, I talked a little bit about the permeability of the gut. What about permeability of the brain? We've heard of a leaky blood-brain barrier. Let's look at that. The brain doesn't really want to have anything that is from the peripheral, including immune cells, to get into the brain because it's a, there's a lot of neurosensitive tissues there. If we have a lot of peripheral immune action, a per, uh, cytokines, bacterial markers, a lot of the stuff we find in our bloodstream, you're going to have a much higher increase of inflammation. When you look at the research, there is research showing that when you have a more permeable blood brain, sorry, gut brain barrier, you're going to have a more permeable blood brain barrier. I'm going to show you a slide right after this one that's going to, that's going to really highlight this for you. But a lot of common neurological conditions, both acute and chronic, have a hallmark of blood brain barrier permeability and gut permeability. Both of those go hand in hand. So let's explore this a little bit further. There are certain factors that control the permeability of the lining between the cells of the blood-brain barrier as well as the gut-brain barrier. So there's something called occludin and zonulin. And you can actually test zonulin to see if there's a permeability in the gut. But zonulin is also present in the blood-brain barrier. So anything that's going to be disrupting zonulin, food sensitivities, inflammation, imbalance in the microbiome. We'll talk about them in a couple of slides, but they're also going to have the same effect on the blood-brain barrier. Researchers found that the, found this microRNA-155. When you when you have, there's an increase in this particular microRNA, this actually is a marker of blood-brain barrier permeability. So now scientists are trying to find a way to test this to see if we can um, actually see if we have a more of a diagnostic capability of testing this marker in something like a trauma, a motor vehicle accident, a concussion, brain injuries. So quite intriguing, but not quite there at the clinical level quite yet. But the takeaway from the research basically is that when your gut becomes leaky, 
your brain is leaky. So that's the key takeaway because now we have some good tools that can address the gut lining. So this is that graphic that I that I told you I'd share with you, and it really is an excellent summary of what we just talked about. You can see neuroinflammation, neurological conditions, the hallmark is neural inflammation, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, whether it's Alzheimer's, whether it's stroke, whether it's concussion, any one of these neurological conditions have the hallmark of neuroinflammation. But the next step is, is that now researchers are showing that the gut lining becomes permeable when these conditions are occurring, especially in acute conditions, and the vagus nerve plays a key role in regulating that. We've already established that. So you can quickly see here how important the vagus nerve is at controlling the, the permeability of the gut. And when the gut becomes more permeable, more inflammatory cells are produced, and that cycles back up to the brain, and now you have an, a neuroinflammatory response and a leaky blood-brain barrier. So there's a lot of things to this diagram that we don't have time to fully unpack, but take a look at a couple of things. For example, the occludin, the zonulin, the claudin, these are the key kind of gates, the, the braces between these, uh, these actual gut lining cells. When they are dysfunctional, then the intestinal lining is gonna be more permeable. The blood brain barrier shares a lot of these. Um, and then notice the connection between a dysfunctional blood-brain barrier as well as a dysfunctional uh, uh, HP axis, which is, again, that stress hormone axis. You can see that on the left side of the diagram here. So a great diagram that showcases a lot of what we've talked about. So what do we do about this? How do we heal the blood-brain barrier? Well, very practically, we have to first take away things that are going to be irritating it. And so a lot of the things that irritate the blood-brain barrier also will irritate the gut lining. So that's a, probably the first place to look. So first of all, blood sugar regulation, food sensitivities and allergies, and excess stress all play a key role in regulating both the gut lining and the, the brain lining. Gluten is one of the biggest disruptors of zonulin. The research is quite strong on the connection of gluten and disrupting barriers in the body. In my practice, I've seen a huge correlation between avoiding gluten and improvement in neurological symptoms. But you have to be very close to 100% avoiding gluten. And this actually can be done after testing, but it can be done before too, because gluten is not just about food sensitivities or food allergies. There's a lot of kind of detrimental impacts that gluten has over and above just causing a food reaction. So that can be specific to zonulin disrupting its function in some of the barriers inside the body. Alcohol is a big disruptor of uh, all types of barriers in the body, creates more permeability and, and edema. And so if you have a brain injury, if you have a neurological issue, you're going to obviously be at increased risk for being susceptible to alcohol and gluten. And then from a food perspective, broccoli, wild blueberries, polyphenols, those colorful plant pigments are all excellent at reversing some of this neg these negative effects and healing the lining of the blood-brain barrier. One thing that I'll briefly mention, and this is just more for interest for a lot of people, from a practical perspective and more of a lifestyle exposure perspective, EMFs, electromagnetic frequencies, are uh, can be a big disruptor of the blood-brain barrier. And so the, the, the particular microwaves, the particular frequencies can increase permeability in the blood-brain barrier, and there's research showing that immune cells don't respond the same way when they're exposed to higher levels of EMF. So consider this when you have Wi-Fi, when you have cordless phones, baby monitors. We're all being bathed by this, but if we can try to remove it or decrease it, especially if a person's trying to have a beneficial impact on the blood-brain barrier, you should consider that. So how can we upregulate our body's own defenses? So this NRF2, uh, this nerve-related growth fa uh, factor 2, and, and this is basically um, an, a, a genetic molecule or, or genetic factor um, that is either turned on or off. And when we consume healthy things, plant polyphenols, curcumin, resveratrol, melatonin, sulforaphane, when we sleep well, we increase the translation and transcription of this particular gene. 
And NRF2 is our body's own powerful antioxidant gene. And so I find this quite really, really interesting because our body has the tools within us to combat some of these detrimental effects. But we have to just unlock it with things that we eat, things that we take, and the lifestyle that we lead. And then obviously decrease some of the things that will potentially aggravate it. One of the things that are that are aggravate that's an aggravator is something called homocysteine. It's a amino acid that's produced in the body in the methionine cycle. When you have adequate levels of B12, folic acid, and trimethylglycine, SAMe, a lot of these methylators, you're going to be able to detoxify homocysteine and it's not a problem. However, if L levels are high, and the only way to really to know is to test. So run some blood work. If homocysteine is above seven, that's when we should take measure measures, talk to your naturopathic doctor to get a homocysteine levels below seven. And then finally, some basic things. So we'll talk about this in a little more detail, but probiotics, vitamin D, magnesium, zinc are all key at regulating the blood brain barrier. This is a great reference guide. So it's it's uh, something that AOR has created. Um, it's going to be on the pro website. Really exciting news that that really has me um, looking forward to it is the the pro specific portal. So if you're a clinician, healthcare practitioner, you'll be able to access some of these unique documents, articles, blogs, videos, webinars, and we're launching that uh, in the new year. And it may actually be even ready earlier, hopefully, but. Think of January 2020, and one of these documents is a great summary of everything you need to know about broccoli, about NRF2, and salt, and the active component sulforaphane. So check that, uh, check that particular resource out. There's some great protocols that our clinicians and medical advisory board put together. Pro-GI repair. I want to talk a little bit about this solution. So I mentioned uh, a number of the ingredients that are helpful at healing the gut lining as well as the blood brain barrier. So we'll focus on the gut with this particular formula, but don't forget that many of the things that are going to be healing the gut lining are also going to be beneficial for the brain, both directly and indirectly. Because if you have a gut that is has a strong integrity, that's not going to be creating a, an excess of an inflammatory response, that's probably going to be absorbing nutrients, you are going to have a better chance of creating and healing a blood brain barrier dysfunction. Okay, a couple of these ingredients you're probably very familiar with, but I want to highlight a number of them that I find to be quite helpful. One of our best, um, one of our most comprehensive pro-specific formulations, uh, and uh, one of the things that are in it is, is a probiotic called Bifidobacter long BB536. And now we've all been bombarded by different types of probiotics, but one thing that AOR has done really, really well is it's found probiotics that are extremely well studied and that have strong human clinical evidence. This particular strain of Bifidobacterium has 40 human clinical trials and also has a, a phenomenal practicality. So the stability, the ability to get down into the small intestine, you can see here the red line is the BB536 strain. And it has both ability to, to be um, stable in room temperature, but also resistance to gastric acid and bile salts. So something to consider when you're looking at a probiotic. Then when you look at the research behind the strain, you start looking at, it has the ability to start changing the microbiome. So it increases not, not just itself, the bifidobacterium family, but also the lactobacillus family. I really like to use probiotics that don't just flood the system, the flood the microbiome, because that's a temporary result, but actually start changing and increasing our body's own microbiome. So almost taking a bit of a fertilizer approach. And there are some probiotics that are really good at doing this. And one of them is this one. And another one is the probiotic three that, that AOR has, which um, you can find a lot more resources again online about that really unique probiotic. I like this one because it has research showing that it improves tight junctions and stimulates IgA, which is the key uh, immune system that controls th that kind of first line of defense at the mucosal membranes, our mouth, our, our nose, our sinuses, and our intestinal lining. So IgA is extremely important and uh, BB536 increases that. 
There was a specific study on IBS patients and also an allergy study. And I found that super intriguing because it tells me it has a systemic effect. So this one was from Japan and it showed that supplementing with this probiotic, just this probiotic for four weeks, decreased allergic symptoms, especially in the eye. So itchiness, some of that histamine reaction that a lot of people get. Um, and it starts balancing Th1 and Th2 immune activity, which is such an important thing when it comes to things like autoimmunity, when it comes to things like chronic infections. And there's research also on candida and also on promoting the elimination of kind of more carcinogenic and, and detrimental hormonal metabolites. So we talk a lot about this formulation. It's also present in uh, in our phase two detox formula. We talk about this formulation in hormonal detoxification, hormonal balancing, especially when it comes to eliminating the excess estrogens, especially in uh, postmenopausal patients where you don't wanna decrease their overall E1, E2 and E3 levels very much. So DIM does that really well, but bifidobacterium can uh, reduce beta glucuronidase activity, which basically helps the reuptake of some of those hormones in the gut. So beta glucuronidase uh, is really important target for not just immune function, but also, and, and, and detoxification, but also for hormonal health. One enzyme that's in this particular formulation is called DPP-4, or it's, it's, it's written as a protease enzyme, but there's basically two different, in that protease, there's two different types. AOR um, many years ago had a DPP-4 standalone, and it was, we were one of the first companies that had this particular enzyme. And what it was good for is it was helped to break down the antigenic burden of consuming things like gluten and casein, even trace amounts. So even if you're trying to avoid this, it is something that is found in and cross-contaminated in, in many different food, especially when you're looking at pro, more processed foods, which is hard to avoid. Uh, there is research on this particular probi uh, sorry, not probiotic enzyme when it comes to applications to developmental disorders. Autism is one of them where a lot of practitioners were using the standalone. Uh, this ANPP is another endopeptidase, which breaks down, again, gluten, gliandin, those proline-rich peptides, much faster than even DPP-4 before gluten can become immune damaging or immune stimulatory or immunogenic. So something that's unique, that has both a probiotic and um, digestive enzyme that is specific to regulating the inflammatory and kind of immunological aspect of certain foods. And then finally, zinc. Zinc is one of my favorites and specifically zinc carnosine. This is a medication used in Japan. So the combination of both zinc, so zinc specifically has the ability to regulate the, the intestinal lining and carnosine has the ability to have a powerful antioxidant effect. So when you put them together, the Japanese researchers found that this was a really powerful medication that could be used for addressing the healing of the lining of the gut. A lot of the intestinal ulcerations, inflammation, one of the hallmarks is free radical inflammatory damage. Carnosine can help quench that. As well as combining zinc with carnosine, you improve the bioavailability because of the connection to an amino acid. So you'll be able, be able to uh, have a better systemic permeability and bioactivity, which is important because zinc is also helpful for blood-brain barrier uh, and also other immune functions throughout the whole body. So it's not just about the gut, even though that's where a majority of the research is. There's a lot of clinical trials specifically on this combination. A lot of it's focused around protecting the gut. For example, this particular study showed that taking NSAIDs, which are very well known at damaging the lining of the gut, increasing permeability and inflammation, the zinc treated group had a 75% reduction in both stomach and small bowel damage. And so that's a very, very powerful endpoint. Consider anybody that's taking ibuprofen or NSAID medications, naproxen, they should be taking some zinc carnosine to offset the negative damage. And ulcer healing can be combined with even standard therapies like the H. pylori therapy. So triple therapy is a very common uh, triple three antibiotics for H. pylori. It's very hard to eradicate. Giving zinc carnosine made it more effective at actually eradicating the 
the H. pylori, which is is quite impressive when you think about when you think about how difficult it is to eradicate this particular bacteria, and as well as ulcers that are occurring outside of the gut. So this is pressure ulcers for people that are lying in in hospital beds for a very long time. So zinc carnosine can be very helpful from a wide range of conditions. Um, specifically to neurological conditions, I mentioned carnosine does have neuroprotective effects. It is a common neuro antioxidants found in many neurological protocols. So I really enjoy the zinc carnosine double whammy because you're getting benefit of both ingredients rather than just doing straight zinc and then having the fine carnosine itself. And it often carnosine, to be honest, doesn't really get the, the proper uh, focus and often is overlooked for other um, more well-known antioxidants and anti-inflammatory botanicals. So that's ProGI Repair, really comprehensive powder, and uh, the, the taste is actually uh, being reformulated. So it's kind of a phenomenal uh, lime, kind of calamansi Thai lime taste, which is is going to mix really, really well. Uh, and you can uh, you can take it both for upper GI can issues or lower GI issues, as well as all the other things that we talked about. So I want to finish off by talking about the endocannabinoid system. So this is uh, something that I did a webinar on back in September, and it's something that is very interesting to a lot of people right now because we obviously in Canada have the legalization of cannabis and marijuana. And we are now starting to understand what the endocannabinoid system is all about, how it has an effect on the body, not just in the brain and the immune system, but through almost every single tissue. And one thing that is really important to understand about the ECS is that it is more than just CB1 and CB2. Those are the two main uh, cannabinoid receptors that we think hemp cannabis has its kind of mechanism of action, but we're now realizing it's actually much more than just those two receptors. In fact, you can see here on the right, there is many, many different receptors, anything from PPAR to the G class, you can see the GPR class receptors. There's three of them there at the top and then one at the bottom. These are the G protein receptors. These actually, some researchers are, are considering CB3 receptors. So we are kind of just scratching the surface of understanding how different receptors are functioning in the endocannabinoid system. And, uh, Obviously, right in the center, you can see CB1 and CB2, our body's internal endocannabinoids, which are um, our AEA and then 2AG, are one of the key molecules. You can see they're, they're right there on either side of CB1. They're a powerful internal or endocannabinoid uh, molecules, and they have that very powerful anti-inflammatory effect and immune balancing effect, that calming effect. But there are other players, and this is where the substance called PEA, this has been AOR's big launch in the last three months. It's been you know, extremely well received and is found very successful because as I'm gonna show you, it's going, it offers something to people, to clinicians that really is unique compared to everything else that is on the market when it comes to addressing inflammation and pain. You can see PEA actually right here at the top. You can see it here that it actually has a role to play on PPAR, the G-class receptors. Mm -hmm. It does not, as you can see, does not directly go into CB1, CB2. And that's one of the things that is unique about it is that it is not a cannabinoid substance. It's actually naturally found in food. It's found in eggs. It's found in palm. It's found in, in wheat germ and soy. It's found in breast milk. So it's a very, very um, commonly found fatty acid amide that is found in the cellular membrane. I'm going to show that to you in just a second. So it has its effect on the endocannabinoid system outside of the classic targets for cannabis or, uh, or a cannabidiol. So that's one of the most unique aspects of the substance called PEA. So PEA, what actually is it? So I mentioned it's a, it's a fatty acid. It's a fatty acid amide. That's the kind of the, the chemical term for it. And it's actually found in our cellular membrane. And it's found in our cellular membrane similar to what an omega-3 is found in our cellular membrane. So it's kind of put in there and it's cleaved out by enzymes just like omega-3s 
as needed by the endocannabinoid system. So you can see here from this, this, this great little graphic showing that a PEA can be, production can be increased under any sort of inflammation, neuroinflammation, pain, stress, any sort of damage to our cellular membrane, that can be UV damage, that can be chemical damage, that can be psychological stress. So it is kind of part of the endocannabinoid system as a kind of a built-in tool that is upregulated when we need to support the endocannabinoid system and our stress coping systems in a, in a bigger way. It's, it's very similar to a saturated fat. So it, it is one of the most natural molecules you can find. And the great thing is, is that we have this ability to get it from uh, from nature in the form of palmitic acid, which is sourced from palms. So we'll talk more about that, but it, the, the, it really is one of these molecules that is a true ortho molecule, which means the body's normally producing it. Our body doesn't produce omega-3s, we have to consume it. So that's something very, the, so the analogy is very similar. So as foundational as omega-3s are, so is PEA. How does PEA work specifically? So I mentioned it kind of has the impact similar to CBD, but it has four unique mechanisms of action. So number one, it can enhance other endocannabinoid activity. So as I mentioned on that little chart with all the different receptors that it targets, it has the ability to increase our body's own endogenous endocannabinoids. These are the most powerful molecules that have that anti-inflammatory effect, have that neurotransmitter balancing effect. So it does that without directly stimulating CB1, CB2, which is why it can be marketed as a natural health product and Health Canada has given it a full license and approval because it does not work in the same mechanism directly as CB as cannabis, but it indirectly complements that same system that cannabis works on. It also activates other unique cellular receptors as I mentioned, so like PPAR is a powerful anti-inflammatory pathway. Uh, and, um, and what it does is that it actually has this ability to regulate it. And so same with that van vanillinoid class of receptors that I showed, um, uh, the TVP class, if you look back at a couple slides, and that is the capsaicin class. That actually has the, the same uh, the same kind of enzymes, sorry, the same receptors that when you rub cayenne or kind of capsation that's found in a lot of over-the-counter pain creams are going to be targeting that receptor. So that's a pain receptor. So it inhibits that receptor. So that is, again, going to have an, uh, kind of an analgesic effect. And then it has uh, the ability to reduce mast cells. So mast cells are one of the key activators of inflammation, of allergies, and specifically very neuroinflammation. So a lot of neuroinflammation is activated by mast cells. So this is a kind of a little bit more of a, a in, intense, robust diagram showing the various mechanisms of action of PEA. You can see that there's five different mechanisms. And if you just simply go through it, I've already verbally talked a lot about uh, a number of these. So you can see P, uh, PEA directly impacts the G-class, PPAR, which are anti-inflammatory. And then it, in, it enhances our body's endocannabinoids to AEA and 2AG. And they will in turn act on CB1, CB2. PEA works on that vanillinoid family class of receptors. And then it works on PPAR, which then in turn works on vanillinoid. So it has this really unique indirect mechanism of action. So it's almost like a secret agent that we have in our body that's ready, waiting in the wings in our cellular membrane, very much like omega-3s and they're, it's being produced as needed. So a lot of that is theoretical and, and mechanistic. So that's understanding the physiology, which is extremely important. But AOR doesn't launch a formulation with just based on theory application. We really want to launch a formulation that has a lot of clinical research. We, we know that it's proven to work. We know how it works. And PEA, really where I think it's, it, it shines is that it has a tremendous amount of research supporting its beneficial mechanism of action. And I mentioned this true ortho molecule. And what that really means is that it's a molecule that's not external. It is something that is being consumed in food all the time, almost like a vitamin. 
almost like an omega-3. So it's that should give you a clue of how foundational it actually truly is. The amount of research on PEA actually blew me away when I started looking at it. 80 years of research, 340 plus PubMed citations, 50 human clinical studies, and we'll go over some of the particular things that are actually studied in those, uh, in those research papers. But majority of the research is focused on inflammation, pain, neuroinflammation and immune function, immune balancing. A lot of the same things that you think of for cannabis, PEA has a very uh, same type of application. And the benefit of PEA, I think, is that it, it really lies in its, in its very, very great safety profile. It's a very low um, risk for adverse effects, no drug interactions. Well, how can this be? How is this possible? Because it, it is that ortho molecule. It's found in nature and it works on the endocannabinoid system which is a system built into our body so it's not like we're taking an external substance like a hemp extract or cannabis or vaping marijuana because now you're having a pharmacological effect you're having a botanical effect that's external so it can be quite helpful and i'm a huge fan of that uh, when used appropriately but it is not even as foundational as something as as pea what I wanted to include is the effect of PEA on the microbiome. I thought that is just really, really intriguing because there's a laundry list of therapeutic indications for PEA, but one of the ones that kind of gets buried at the bottom of that list is its impact on the gut microbiome and the gut lining itself. So there's clinical studies showing that, for example, this first one, PEA, is as effective as, as CBD at reducing gut permeability. This is a recent study in 2019. Uh, they found that PEA supplementation decreased pain, restored microbiome by increasing this acromancia probiotic. So acromancia is, and now that we're starting to understand stool testing and microbiome testing, this is kind of like the holy grail of probiotics. We really wanna increase acromancia as much as possible. Uh, and bacteroides as well. And PEA supplementation increases the good bacteria. So this is, again, something so foundational and, and brings the conversation of PEA back full circle, back to the gut-brain connection, which is the topic of what we're discussing today. So I found that really, really, uh, really enlightening. And it gives us another reason why PEA should be as foundational and as in a protocol as omega-3s because it really has this ability to work as a gatekeeper. So for example, you can see here the gatekeepers, PEA like 2AG is one of those gatekeepers. So when it is prop, when it's in proper amounts, it's going to have a beneficial effect on that tight junction, keeping the permeability of the intestinal lining low and keeping the microbiome into the, in the gut lumen but also it has the ability to enhance good bacteria. You can see here with that G-class receptor. So that same receptor that is part of the endocannabinoid system. And this is one of the things that we're now discovering is that the endocannabinoid system has a really potent role to play in the gut lining and regulating of gut function. So I think including PEA in our gut formulations, in our, in our gut protocols, and thinking about it for more than just chronic pain, where majority of the research is, 19 human clinical trials, I think is going to be very beneficial. And these are some of the other research-based indications of PEA, some more than others. But for example, eye health is one that has an, a, a fairly good amount of research showing its beneficial effects. Same with topical application to derm dermatological conditions, neurological conditions, Probably the best one is neuropathic pain. This is one that we focus a lot on in the webinar. So if you want more information about PEA, I encourage you to watch the webinar. It's on our website. Um, you just click on the education, the webinar tab, and you can get um, access to it for free. Download the, uh, the presentation slide and review it because I think it's really going to be a game changer for a lot of things uh, that we may not have had great tools to address. So in summary, when we're thinking about the gut-brain axis, we have to think about four key areas. And I've touched on these four key areas in the last 50 minutes or so. Number one, 
we have, and we're going to start from the bottom up, which is kind of the foundation, what I would consider. We have to consider our neurological activation, our vagus nerve. Is our sympathetic nervous system overriding our vagus nerve? What tools do we have? I mentioned some of the lifestyle things, some of the things like theanine, some of the things like holy basil that help reduce the excess sympathetic nervous system. Um, also balancing the HPA axis, our hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. Another one of those brain connections down to the down to the abdomen and to our organ systems. When the HP axis is properly regulated, we are in an anti-inflammatory environment. But when it's depleted, when the adrenal system is not properly functioning, we either have too much cortisol or we have too little cortisol. And the body really likes that sweet spot. So that's a great place to start. And we talked about a number of tools earlier to address those things. And then we can then go to specifically addressing the permeability of the gut lining with things like zinc, with things like carnosine, with things like specific probiotics like the BB536, Bifidobacter. We can start looking at L-glutamine. We can start looking at vitamin D. We can start looking at specific probiotics that will start modulating microbiome support. And then finally, PEA as, as a novel, really unique way of decreasing chronic inflammation, neuropathic pain, as well as supporting the microbiome directly. So hopefully that gives you a, a good starting place in understanding that we have these powerful anti-inflammatory pathways within our body. We often need to just get out of our body's own way allow it to switch into healing mode, switch into parasympathetic mode, stimulate the vagus nerve, fuel it properly, uh, and, and help our body to just basically get back into balance and really creating a very optimal gut-brain connection. So that's everything that I wanna share with you today. I think we have a couple minutes. I'll turn it over to Cassie if there are any questions, but um, uh, thank you everyone so far for, uh, for their attention. And I look forward to answering any questions that anyone might have. Thanks, Paul. That was a very informative, awesome presentation. Um, we have received several questions throughout the presentation. Um, and I, I think to give them the um, time that they deserve, what we'll do is we'll compile them all in a Q&A and send it out in the follow-up email. Um, okay. So if you have any further questions or additional questions that you haven't got already up on the screen, um, you can email them to marketing at AOR.ca. So that's M-A-R-K-E-T-I-N-G at AOR.ca. And we will um, get Dr. Herkel to answer all of those and send them out in the follow-up email. Also, um, we want you all to stay tuned for our 2020 webinar series. We'll be announcing the details for those upcoming presentations in December. And otherwise, thank you all for taking the time to join us today and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, everyone.